Thank you all for joining us today. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual event. Cheers to 65 years celebrating the NPS partnership with SCA. My name is Kyle Yaruso. I'm an SCA alum and a member of the SCA Alumni Council. I currently work as the volunteer and youth programs coordinator at Rock Creek Park, an NPS unit here in Washington, DC. And I'll be moderating today's session. We're here today to celebrate the National Park Service's 65 years of partnership with the Student Conservation Association. We have a great lineup of speakers and panelists today who will share how being an SCA alum has impacted their lives. SCA recently reached the milestone of placing more than 100,000 members into the field since 1957. SCA members have left their footprints at many local, state and national parks, wildlife refuges, national forests, and coastal areas in all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. SEA's network of 100,000 alumni has global reach with folks living here in the US and as far away as New Zealand. From Olympic National Park and Grand Teton National Park, where it all began, to state parks and urban green spaces in so many city centers, SCA was the first organization to establish a youth core of this caliber and has become a model for the current core movement. We will first have introductions by our Student Conservation Association and National Park Service representatives, followed by a panel discussion, Q&A, and closing remarks. I'd like to thank all who have helped put together today's presentation. We're so honored you're here today. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat box in Zoom or in the comments on our Facebook page at any time. And we will address some of them during our Q&A portion. Feel free to keep your cameras on so that we can all see each other and who's on the call today. Also, please feel free at this time to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from. Please do note that today's event is recorded and a link to the recording of this session will be posted on the official event page in the coming days. The event will be live captioned um, and there's an available link which will be posted now in the chat. We also have ASL interpreters, Andrew and Michelle present with us today and they'll be spotlighted along with the speakers for everyone's accessibility. And at this time, I'd, uh, I'd like to introduce Patricia Malicia, Senior Director of Alumni Engagement and Direct Response at Student Conservation Association, who will now who will explain more about SCA's 65th anniversary partnership with the National Park Service. And with that, over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I just wanted to uh, say welcome to everyone. I wanted to say thank you so much for coming. Um, we're very excited to have you all here. We're very excited to have so many alumni, so many National Park Service, and so many friends of our two organizations here together. As Kyle mentioned, uh, we did start SCA 65 years ago this year um, with original volunteers in Grand Teton and Olympic National Parks in 1957. Um, and that is where it all began with this partnership between the National Park Service and SCA. And through our subsequent alliances with the National Forests, Wildlife Ref Refuges, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and all of the different federal agencies, we have been able to accomplish accomplished so much in the last 65 years. Um, we're really, really proud to have blazed this trail of youth service and stewardship all across uh, our country and to have really set the path for a lot of other conservation corps that came after us. As Kyle mentioned, we did place our 100,000th member into the field this past summer, and we're really proud of the alumni network that we have built, this multi-generational international alumni network of 100,000 members. And so this year, we have been celebrating our 
SCA 100K celebration um, that showcases our members, our alumni, our partners, all of the people that have made this partnership possible, that have shaped stronger communities, that have made our world more resilient. And we're really proud of what, of what we have accomplished together. And we really do want to um, show you what we've accomplished together by the alumni that are going to be present today. And the last thing I did want to mention is that our founder, Liz Putnam, who was the person with this idea um, that we as students could really help save the national parks that presented this idea in her, her thesis at Vassar College, who's won the Presidential Citizens Medal from President Barack Obama is here with us today. We are really, really honored to have her here with us today. Um, and if you're interested in saying hello to Liz or asking Liz a question, please do put that in the chat. We're very excited that she could join us since this is all for her. This is you know, her pride and joy. She created this. So we're very excited to have her with us as well. So thank you all so much for being here. We're excited for the panel and the alumni speakers and we're just happy for you all to be here. Um, thanks so much and I'll turn it back over to Kyle. Thank you, Patricia. And next we have Floyd V. Myers, the Acting Chief of Youth Programs and the Experienced Services Program Division at the National Park Service, who will give us an overview of the youth and young adult programs here and talk about the partnership with the, with the SCA. Over to you, Floyd. Thank you, Kyle. Hello everyone, it's good to see everybody in the room. My name is Floyd Myers. I am the Acting Chief of the Youth Program Division and Experience Services Programs. Um, first, I'd like to say congratulations to SCA and NPS on the 65th anniversary. Um, we provide services through um, cooperative agreements and task agreements to pro uh, provide resources through financial assistance. Um, SCA is one of our biggest partners. Uh, we've been in business a long time. Personally, I've worked with SCA since the beginning of my career, and that was early 2009, and um, pretty much brought them to every park that I've been through. I've managed uh, in the acting capacity, some of the Montgomery, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Booker T. Washington in Roanoke, Virginia, Martin Luther King and Patterson Great Falls. And every park that I've been to, SCA has been a, a firm partner of ours and we, um, we bring them with us. Uh, as far as the internship goes and on a personal level, I try to use the partnership as a segue or a means to bring interns into full-time positions with the National Park Service. And I believe that we've done a, a pretty good job at that. I'd like to share some of this floor with uh, one of my colleagues and good friends who actually built this youth program division. His name is uh, George McDonald and he's in the room and I'm hoping he could come on and say a few words before he hands it over to Kyle. Hey, George, how are you? I'm doing fine and congratulations to the Student Conservation Association. Um, I've been, the chief of National Park Service Youth Programs uh, for 16 years. And I remember like it was the day before yesterday when you all were celebrating your 50th anniversary. And the very first meeting that I had, which started out as a four month detail, which is it's effectively become my life's work, uh, was with the Student Conservation Association. Uh, my good friends, Scott Weaver and Flip Hager. And um, those individuals are, are not only good and close personal friends, but were invaluable mentors and helped really set the stage and the tone for how I'd like to carry out my professional work when it comes to youth and young adult programs. Um, but it should be noted that under just the amazing imagination and brilliance of Liz Putman as a student, uh, when she put together her senior thesis and accepted the challenge from her professor to develop the modern day service and conservation core movement, which has grown to include more than 150 organizations. Uh, we at the Department of Interior 
probably engage in uh, 50 to $60 million worth of projects with service and conservation corps. And those numbers will continue to grow as we com combat uh, new challenges such as climate change, um, rampant wildfires, um, looking at ways to preserve and conserve our natural and cultural resources. And SCA has been a leader every step of the way. Uh, I just can't thank you enough for all you have done, not only for um, our federal land management agencies, and that's every single one of them, but what the Student Conservation Association has done uh, for this country, for this country's resources, and how you all have instilled an ethic of service in millions of people, not just 100,000 that have come through the Student Conservation Association. And so um, my internal thanks uh, to everyone associated with SCA and continued success. And I see the future as being extremely bright for both the Student Conservation Association as well as our country's natural and cultural resources. And I'll pass it back. Thank you so much, George and Floyd. And speaking of, uh, SCA's founder, Liz Putnam. We will now play a special video. Hi, I'm Liz Putnam. SCA started because there was a terrific need in our national parks. In the 50s, there were so few rangers and naturalists on duty. Lack of manpower, lack of money. Our parks were being loved to death. Work needed to be done. And I felt, why couldn't us young ones get out there and be of help? Why couldn't we all do the work that needed to be done? And so that basically was the idea where SEA started from, a student conservation association, where we all can help our country by protecting this land for the future. And the exciting thing about this is that it's a two-way street. Not only do our parks benefit from the essential work needed to be done, but it's amazing what it does for the individual as well. Because when one is giving of self, genuinely giving of self, you've opened yourself to, in a sense, who you are and who you might want to be to stretch further than they ever had known that they could do. The personal benefits, the connections with nature, leadership development, and career experience are all so extraordinary. And it's all helping protect our beloved national parks. That's what excites me about SEA, because it benefits all all who are involved. Having you on the SEA team means so much to me. Thank you for being part of our mission. I invite our panelists to turn on their webcams as I introduce them. Our panelists are all SCA alum who have served with federal agencies, uh, land management agencies that is, or nonprofit uh, organizations. We have first Amy Schiller, the stewardship coordinator at the Minnesota Land Trust. We have Chris Setley, an F-35 international logistics lead at the Department of Defense. We have Angie Quesada, a former Student Conservation Association member, and most recently with the SCA Idaho Corps. We have Jay Fennell, a hydrologist and water quality program specialist at the Washington Department of Ecology. And last but not least, Donna Shaver, the chief of sea turtle science and recovery at the National Park Service. Thank you all for joining me on camera. And so for this first question, it'll be addressed to everyone. How did your time with SCA impact your career trajectory and lead you to where you are now? And feel free to briefly mention any SCA projects or programs that you worked on and where, and maybe a fun fact about yourself. You'll have a chance to go more in depth on the second question. We'll start with Amy 
and then go to Chris, Angie, Jay, and Donna uh, in that order. And so we'll start with you, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Schiller. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am wearing a blue, very fancy um, SCA Technical AmeriCorps shirt that I received um, when I was in service. Um, I served technically three times during internships with the Student Conservation Association. Um, first as a biological technician with the National Park Service Academy at Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Um, that was in 2015. And then as a trails partnership intern at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park in Woodstock, Vermont from 2015 to 2016. And then as a GIS specialist intern um, with the National Park Service Cultural Resources GIS Department in Washington, DC um, from 2017 to 2018. And now I serve as a member of the SCA Alumni Council from 2019 to present. Um, so obviously I've done a lot of roles with the SCA and I'm so grateful for the opportunities that I've been able to have. Um, I think they've truly given me a lot of experience in um, natural resources positions that uh, led me to the full-time employment that I am in now and um, gave me a lot of really great um, life skills, um, connected me with awesome mentors and uh, let me see really cool spots in the country as well. So thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Amy. Chris? Hi, my name is Chris Setley. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am wearing a blue suit um, because I am, uh, on a work trip to Fort Worth, away from Washington, D.C. And I, in my background, have Hurricane Ridge from Olympic National Park um, behind my head. You see Mount Olympus. I was just able to go out there uh, over the summer. It was quite a trip. Um, and I, just like all the parks, they're life-changing. Um, I am a... 45-year-old uh, white male. Um, I served in Cedar Breaks National Monument in 1997 in between my junior and senior year of college. And it was my first trip of many out west. Um, it was a big deal for me and for my family. I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was the first person to start uh, traveling and inspiring my family to get out there. And uh, SEA provided that opportunity, and I have been traveling since. Um, the SEA, um, to um, I just reference uh, Liz, um, I, I learned professional skills about teaming. Um, I teamed with the, Nash, uh, the US Geological Service or Survey and um, the National or the um, the Forest Service um, as part of working through the National Park Service. Um, I learned a lot about safety. Um, that was something that I wasn't really exposed to. I was living in a cabin at 10,000 feet, and that was pretty special. But there were a lot of deer, a lot of animal, um, and the, there was only one roadway. So I learned a lot about safety and lightning strikes. Um, <laughs> and so I've used those lessons um, since um, and the teamwork skills I have continued to build on. It was, SEA was life-changing for me. Thank you, Chris. Angie? Hi, my name is Angie Casado. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I am a Latina wearing a SEA shirt with the SEA logo, short hair. Um, as you can see, my background is that of um, one view from the City of Rocks. Uh, we also, I also um, joined SCA back in high school, which is nine years ago, back in 2013 as a community crew member. Um, I recently just completed my fifth SCA experience um, with the SCA Idaho Corps. I was also a alumni engagement fellow earlier this year as well. Um, 
And I always wanted to work outdoors ever since I was a kid, just be outdoors as much as I can. Um, someone from a big city don't really get that opportunity unless you're nearby a park. Um, my family always thought I was crazy, wanting to work outdoors, wanting to um, be able to work in trail works um, and educate other people about it. But it's something that I have greatly appreciated and want to continue later um, in my career. Thanks, Angie. Jay? Yes, hello everyone. Uh, it's really, really energizing to be part of this event today. Uh, my name is Jay Fennell. I use he, him pronouns. I'm uh, wearing a brown shirt. I'm an early 30s Black male. And my background is of a mountain view of Long's Peak at Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, this particular view was part of my daily commute when I was uh, part of the trail crew there. And um, is a cherished view shot and um, just brings back good memories. Um, my time at SCA first started in 2014 as a historical preservation crew member in New Jersey. I uh, then worked in California as a habitat restoration spe specialist and then um, would then go from there to work as a trail crew member with the Rocky Mountain National Park. I'd say throughout all of those experiences um, shaped my trajectory by just exposing me to a lot of the different missions of different federal agencies and just kind of helped me figure out where I would want to establish myself and try to just build that professional network, get to work with amazing people um, and push my comfort zone, uh, kind of moving far away from home, originally from the East Coast, um, just trying to push beyond what I thought I could do and hopefully surprise myself in the process. So um, I'll, I'll always be grateful to SCA for allowing me those opportunities and um, just doing great work for the benefit of the public and the environment. Thank you, Jay. Donna? Yes, my name is Dr. Donna Shaver and I had my SCA appointment in 1980. And this was between my junior and senior years of undergraduate school. I saw the announcement on an old cork board at Cornell and saw the description of the work with the endangered Kemp's Release Sea Turtle. And I little did I know that when I arrived here at the National Seashore, it would become my home. I learned so much about the plight of the Kemp's Ridley and how it had almost been decimated in a blink of an eye in one human generation from human activities. And I decided right then that I wanted to dedicate my career to trying to help save this magnificent endangered species so that it, it could be enjoyed by future generations. I wanted to make a difference and the SCA provided me a career that I likely never would have had otherwise to apply my knowledge and grow, uh, get degrees, become an expert in this field and uh, known by many to be the expert on Kemp's really in the United States because I wanted to be a professional that could do my best job to help protect this resource. And the numbers of these endangered species have come up, but it's a still highly uh, endangered species with more work to go. But I transformed from shy Donna from Syracuse, New York, afraid to speak, ran it and cut and, and dropped my speech class to take scientific writing instead to someone who has to speak for the turtles because they can't speak for themselves. And now I give presentations to hundreds more than a thousand people sometimes. And uh, I am tremendously grateful to SCA for giving me my this experience. And now I hire SCA interns and I tell them that I was where you are. You can become anything you'd like, uh, but this provides a, a safe area for their first experiences in the workplace. 
and they take on the spark of dedication. And I've seen so many go on to do great things too. So I feel like a proud mama of, of them. And uh, it's wonderful to pass on to another generation because that's what it's all about uh, is, is to try to keep this spark of dedication, trying to make a difference into the next generations. So I thank Liz Putman from the bottom of my heart uh, for giving me this opportunity and giving so many other people life-changing opportunities. Thank you, Donna. And thank you all for those responses. I now have a different question for each one of you. Um, and I'll start again with you, Amy. You were recently named the 2022 Minnesota GIS LIS Emerging Professional Award winner. First, congratulations. Second, can you explain more about what this is? And is there a specific project or internship that you did with SCA that's influenced your career path? Yeah, so thank you, first of all. Um, the award, um, I was really grateful to have been nominated by um, some of my GIS mentors in the local um, community. Um, GIS stands for Geospatial Information um, Technology, I guess. Um, yeah, feel free to chip in if you remember what that S stands for. <laughs> um, science, maybe? Um, systems. Duh. Yes, that makes sense. Um, and um, so my award was um, intended to recognize individuals who are in the early stages of their career and um, demonstrate an understanding of the GIS community and um, GIS concepts above and beyond what are expected. Um, so I was really grateful to receive that um, award and be recognized by my coworkers and my community. So. Um, that was really great. Um, and I think some of my experiences um, working with the SCA and specifically um, my internship working with the cultural resources GIS department um, with the National Park Service was really um, kind of opened the door for me in terms of my professional experience in uh, being able to work for a federal agency on um, uh, database um, with, you know, the chief of um, cultural resources GIS and work on a really meaningful project and um, have an impact within such a short time of an internship, you know, one year. Um, so, hi, Deidre. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, I know Deidre um, continues to um, hire additional SCA interns to continue the work that um, several SCA interns started within the program. And um, I'm just really grateful for that opportunity and um, really enjoyed it and think it was so pivotal to my beginning of my um, GIS career. Thank you, Amy. And now to you, Chris. Uh, you currently work uh, at the Department of Defense and are a veteran. First, thank you for your service. If you could tell us about your how your time in the military influenced what you wanted to do and talk more about your time at Cedar Breaks National Monument. Sure, thank you, Kyle. So the order was um, SEA, then Marine Corps. So I'll start with the Marine Corps. Um, well, actually, I'll start with the SCA. So like Donna, um, in between junior and senior year, I went out west and I went to Cedar Breaks National Monument, which is just breathtaking. And I had never seen anything like that. Um, I lived in a tiny cabin, 10,300 feet. My neighbor was a golden eagle, which was magical because there was the national forest at the top of the plateau that went for miles. And, but then it ended abruptly at the amphitheater at Cedar Breaks National Monument and formed this unbelievable amphitheater about four miles wide. And the Golden Eagle would uh, maybe 5.30 in the morning fly over my tiny little cabin and go to the rim. I don't know what 
uh, it did there. Um, but I would hear its gigantic wings flapping. And because it was such a, um, I don't wanna say austere, but remote area and the cabin was just not next to anything really. I heard the noise of the eagle and it was, it's something that has stayed with me for, well, until this day. And that's been 25 years. Um, so Cedar Breaks is just this magical gem. And the fact that the National Park Service preserves the land like that is, a, it's inspirational because our country is filled with natural wonders like that. And the fact that we preserve them is such a testament to what we do um, as a country. And I, I have an utmost respect for that. Um, this is a good segue to the Marine Corps. With the Marine Corps, I travel a lot. I'm still with the Marine Corps. I'm not in the Marine Corps anymore, but I work at the Pentagon on um, programs. Um, I'm currently with the F-35 program, which is a jet. Um, it's part of a portfolio of weapon systems that protect um, the United States. Um, but And with that um, job, I travel a lot and I see countries that don't uh, preserve and conserve um, natural resources, um, cultural resources, um, like we do. And, and the connection that I draw between the SCA um, and the Marine Corps is those two were both early career experiences that um, gave me um, a foundation that I have continued to build on since. Um, they're, you could say pretty different, uh, but if you look at it from a systems engineering approach, uh, which is what I kind of do, um, it's a logical approach towards like a science approach, right? Like your engineering and science approach towards either conservation of natural resources or cultural resources. And then for what I do, it's um, limited resources like manpower and um, systems that when it comes to the United States cost a lot of money as we probably all know, but we do make an effort to um, apply a system to engineering approach to how we develop them and then field them. And so, you know, we have a, a sea turtle scientist on, which is a, very inspirational to me. And I think that um, we have GIS scientists on. And it, it's to me, the, the connection is science. Um, conservation is about a scientific a methodology towards conservation. And resources are not just natural. Um, um, the National Park Service gentleman that spoke earlier, I apologize, I forgot his name. He gave me the term cultural resource too. And I'm gonna hang on to that because that's really important. Just not natural resources, but limited resources in general. And that's really what I do for a living. Um, I um, attempt to work with the team to preserve um, the resources that we feel um, to um, again, defend the country. Um, and if we don't take a scientific approach towards designing for sustainment and then um, a systems engineering approach towards how we sustain the weapon systems, we're going to waste money. Um, and we're also going to not have an integrated portfolio and that creates risk to the defense of the country. So, um, that's, I hope that made sense, the connecting the SCA to the Marine Corps. The teamwork, the, just the professional um, teamwork, that's something that, again, another connection. Um, I was an interpretive park ranger when I was a, um, in the SCA, and I learned stuff about myself that I didn't know. I didn't know that I really enjoyed talking with people. I always thought I was an introvert, but when I was a park ranger giving guided hikes or campfire talks, I learned that I really enjoy interacting with people. I enjoy um, telling tales. And then I still do that in Marine Corps. If I don't do that, I can't really lead because the work is there, but if you don't 
know how to take care of your people on your team um, by you know engaging with them and um, valuing what they bring and cutting the tension and having respect for their effort you're just not going to have a sustainable team so again that's a manpower resource i i spent a lot of time on that um, and then kind of a segue into the other aspect diversity in the workforce so, or in the workplace. Um, so that's something that I'm much more intentional about. Um, and I wanna break that up into enterprise, group, and individual. As an enterprise, the F-35 is about 2,400 people. And there are 16 nations that we um, work with. And so how do you work with 16 nations? to support a platform at an affordable cost around the world. Well, it's diverse by its nature, but how do you lean into that diversity? So from an enterprise perspective, you recruit people from diverse backgrounds. You're intentional about where you recruit from. Um, college is obvious um, which colleges you go to, but then, College is not the only recruitment. There are people that have skill sets that um, add tremendous value to a particular um, set of tasks that we need. And so, um, if you're, you know, you think about where you recruit from, you bring that diversity in from an enterprise perspective. And also, when you bring them in, you have to be inclusive of them. And so, how do you include them? Do you have workshops? Um, we have what we call rap sessions. Um, we had a guest speaker, the first black cardiologist, Dr. Francis. That was a huge hit. Um, we have coffee hours where we um, try to capture, um, you know, like fact findings, um, ways in which we can improve our enterprise. And then, you know, this is supported by our, our boss and we attempt to implement um, those best practices and the ideas that the diverse set of voices have. And because we have multiple languages, we have uh, so many different cultures, um, it's beyond just the United States. And so that's something that I actually um, learned when I was an SCA member. I remember a particular talk of a German um, park guest, and it was just so, life-changing for me to interact with him. I had never really, he was, he really enjoyed my guided hike and he gave me feedback. And that kind of like feedback was not something I really had that much experience. I was a, what, 20 year old. And so that, that stuck with me and I continued to use that. And, you know, diversity in the workplace from an enterprise perspective, you can create that situation where people have the space to provide their ideas and to give feedback and um, to lead um, from their perspective to say, this is a good idea. I think that we should do this either in a small group or individual or maybe a whole enterprise perspective. So that ties into the group, um, small group. We have lots of different teams doing various things. And so the key for me is to be inclusive um, and to mentor. Um, from an individual perspective, um, I make myself available and um, I attempt to ensure that each person has a mentor. Um, and I think that goes a long way with giving them a voice for, and just being comfortable with where they're at. Um, by the nature of the program, we have to be um, inclusive. Um, but we're always, we're not always that good at it. Um, and I find that if we are intentional from the beginning, when we recruit new people, that it, it lasts and the, that engages them from the beginning and gives them a voice. And that that's how I, um, advocate for diversity in the workplace. Over. Thank you so much, Chris. And with that, uh, we'll go to you, Angie. Uh, you started your SCA experience in high school. Can you walk us through what you thought the experience might be like? Uh, 
and what the experience really was like. Um, and, and tell us more about your time at City of Rocks National Reserve. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Angie. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I joined the SCA nine years ago in high school, which if I mean, to put on a timeline, it was in 2013. Um, actually, when I first joined, I thought I would continuously work outdoors for the time being. Um, I was a community crew member in during the fall and winter program of 2013 and again it be outdoors again being from Chicago it'd be cold windy um back in my mind I thought it'd be a little miserable but SEA took really good care of us um they, they were very well aware of the weather forecast and did their best to accommodate and have us be able to access to um the program itself um so as mentioned before, I thought I'd be working outdoors all the time, but in reality, I was given many opportunities to go on field trips, go visit visitor centers in nearby Cook County forest preserves and learn about um, the wildlife in my area, the wildlife surrounding my city, as well as the plant life, um, also identifying the native and invasive species that are also lived in our area. Um, I was also given education, environmental education days, which involved my crew and I having to work together on team projects, um, learning about renewable energy, learning about our environmental progressors in the city. One being Jens Jensen was is the biggest known um, landscape architect who helped build and manage the Chicago city parks. Um, so it was it was just a lot more than just having to brush pile up and clean up trail parks. It was more of a immersive experience for me. And I really enjoy that um, as someone who does get bored pretty easily on some projects. I love the diversity of that, the diversity aspect. And they, I also love the fact that SCA was willing to provide so much information to um, a group of kids who didn't have that, didn't have access to that information, especially minorities from minority uh, communities. So that was what my SCA experience like was back in high school. Um, fast forward to my previous, um, my most recent SEA experience. Um, I just completed my fifth SEA um, experience with the SEA Idaho Corps. Um, one of the bigger projects was I would stay in City of Rocks for a month. Um, and here in my background, you can see it. Um, it's just the picture that I took of it. It's beautiful. Coworkers, a heat advisory for them would be over 100 degrees, but in City Rocks it was over 90 degrees for those couple weeks. But little did they tell you that the sun would be beating on you, so that did take a toll. Um, we what we did was um, we removed old check steps and install new check steps. And City Rocks is just commonly a ton of plumes coming out from the ground and those plumes are mainly from like fine granite. So we would have to install rebar in some granite or in some sections of granite, which wasn't all fun, but you know, it just kind of kind of gave you some discipline on what letting you know what your strengths are, what you could do, what are the best tactics to complete this project. And within the first two weeks, we had about 50 check steps installed, including some a couple of water bars. Um, but for the remainder of my time at City of Rocks, me and my crew would just continue to remove old barbed wire fences and install new barbed wire fences on the side of the hill. And that was an experience because um, the first project had us in the valley of City of Rocks, where our second project had us more up in the hills, kind of overseeing all of City of Rocks. You got to see um, uh, Brett Loves, uh, Brett Loves, you get to see Twin Peak Sisters, um, 
and just see it all. And the purpose of the barbed wire was to help ensure that the cattle that were grazing, the high grazing rights in the, the natural reserve um, wouldn't go past these borders or these boundaries, but also wouldn't fall <laughs> um, off a mountain either. So it was more so for the safety of their, themselves, but also ensuring that they don't cross over in areas that they are not supposed to be in. Um, overall, I didn't expect to enjoy working in the desert with, with the exception of the first two weeks, um, but little do you realize that there is a lot of wildlife there and it's beautiful. And um, now thinking back to it, having a reflective moment, I, I genuinely enjoyed it and I actually hope to go back to City of Rocks for more of a, a leisure experience than a working experience. But it overall was an amazing time I had. Um, got to hear coyotes running through our campsite. Just the first time, um, heard owls. And since City of Rocks is considered a dark city, I was able to experience a Milky, a very vague Milky Way at night every so often. So that was just something that I can't experience back here, back in my city of Chicago. But I hope one day to come back to it. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. And we've now heard from a few of our speakers. I'd just like to remind everyone uh, that you'll feel free to submit any questions or comments that you have for our speakers in the chat um, with your name and uh, your affiliation and, and your question. And we will do our best to answer those during our Q&A portion. And with that, um, Jay, my next question is for you. Um, so your pathway to where you are now is, is intricate. Can you tell us about your time working at Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area and your time at Rocky Mountain National Park? And also talk about uh, how you balance being both a student and working full time. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to take a deep dive into that. Um, I'd say starting out, my time at the Water Gap was truly eye-opening um, figuring out, especially when I figured out I was gonna be working in New Jersey. I think I had other expectations for what I wanted my first SCA program to be. And I think I had some misgivings about working in New Jersey until, until I got there. I was completely blown away by um, all the natural beauty there, um, especially when I think I just had the kind of hyper industrialized and hyper urbanized kind of setting in my head when I went in there. So I was very pleasantly surprised and kind of shaped my whole um, outlook um, working with SCA and, and beyond just um, being prepared to have my expectations, you know, kind of shattered along the way. Um, but uh, in a good way, of course, um, I'd say we started out just camping. Um, the whole time, basically, over a three month summer uh, project period. That was my first time really spending that much time outdoors uh, for an extended period of time. So there was a, a lot of kind of bound, like a uh, comfort level break, boundary breaking there. Um, I was very, very shocked with how, how I turned out with that. Um, the bulk of the work focused on uh, repainting old buildings. Uh, we were staying at this uh, Boy Scout camp that had been uh, all but abandoned for, I think, over 40 or 50 years. And so there was a lot of vandalism and just kind of derelict buildings that we were tasked with rehabilitating. Um, and there was another part of that project was doing uh, lead paint abatement and some asbestos abate abatement. Um, and some of the older, a lot older structures, um, some were in an actual historic town that we were working in. And so there was a lot of, you know, hard certifications that we actually got um, out of that program, getting, you know, lead paint abatement certification and asbestos like awareness certification, things I never thought I'd ever be exposed to or um, frankly need, but um, was extremely valuable coming out of there. Um, and it was just a kind of a, an extra added bonus with that part of the program. Um, one experience that stood out in particular was having to pull out old insulation from underneath a structure that uh, now I probably don't necessarily see myself ever doing something like that, but 
the insulation function more like uh, squirrel and mice habitat than insulation, but um, I felt pretty invincible getting a having a Tyvek suit with the cuffs taped up and the boots taped up so that, you know, uh, impenetrable. Um, so I really felt like I could kind of do anything um, given the right equipment. Um, and that's something I felt uh, was a pretty big takeaway coming out of there. I think something uh, kind of Donna even alluded to earlier about having it being in a safe environment to kind of push beyond what you think you're comfortable doing. Um, and SEA kind of facilitated that start to finish. Um, with working at Rocky Mountain uh, National Park, that was definitely a crash course in uh, living the kind of rugged trail crew lifestyle. Um, I think the, the months prior to that, I'd spent most of that time at maybe 2,000 feet. So initially, the immediate adjustment of having to live, you know, almost, you know, what, 7,000, 7,500 feet um, elevation was automatically out the gate a, a, a challenge and at times a struggle. Um, especially the first couple of days commuting up, kind of walking along the view in the background here, uh, uh, humbly stepping aside as the uh, Park Service uh, trail crew would just, you know, soldier on. Um, but uh, that was, you know, part of the challenge, but also very inspirational. And, um, you know, was really looking forward to kind of being a part of the uh, high performance team. Um, you know, we started out initially doing, um, you know, kind of routine trail maintenance, like brushing, cleaning out water bars. Um, but then as we kind of got more acclimated and uh, more just used to the kind of just work demand, um, we started to build a lot more larger and more complicated structures. Uh, we did like a, a rock buttressed um, log bridge that had previously been blown out from flooding. Um, got to move massive boulders out of you know, out of the trail, out of the rivers, um, and just a whole slew of kind of challenging projects. Um, and it was extremely rewarding um, and inspiring to just be a part of that kind of high functioning team and, and completing those projects. Um, with being a, so I'm also a part-time graduate student um, here in Washington, and while also working full-time uh, currently at Department of Ecology, I feel like it's definitely the hardest thing I've ever elected to do, um, but I manage it kind of by taking each day at a time, just being deliberate about where I devote my time and trying to isolate those areas where um, just staying very task oriented, I suppose. Um, the quarter system I'm into is very kind of breakneck pace, so there's always an assignment, there's always something due, and it doesn't really ever let up. Um, so just being kind of realistic about what I can accomplish on any given day, reprioritizing some things that um, I typically would, uh, yeah, just reprioritizing kind of other things around life, like socializing. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely, uh, I don't like using the term sacrifice, just reprioritizing kind of where, where I spend my time um, and just spending a lot of time planning um, and having very flexible um you know, expectations and people at, at my job are very flexible too with how I, where I spend my time and how I spend my time. So that really helps. Um, just got to stay organized and plan, plan efficiently. So I hope that answered the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Jay. And uh, now a question for you, Donna. So you were an SCA member working at Padre Island. Uh, National Seashore back in 1980, uh, which again just shows how much SCA has had a presence over all the years. Uh, and you're now the Chief of Sea Turtle Science and Recovery at the park. Uh, you also re recently, or excuse me, uh, not necessarily recently, uh, you let us know when you received a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for the International Sea Turtle Society, among many other honors. Um, so if you can tell us more about how being introduced to that coastal park through SCA sparked your passion uh, for, for the sea turtles and the roles that it's played, uh, the role that you've played in helping bring sea turtles back to the park. Well, when I was an undergraduate student at Cornell, I decided that I wanted to uh, work with endangered species for my career. And I read through all the opportunities around the country and then 
uh, my eye was really spotted the work with Kemsworthy sea turtles at Potter Island National Seashore. I had never been to the ocean before. I had never seen a sea turtle before. But I wanted to help one of those species that uh, humans had decimated and do my part to try to help recover them. And uh, it has been a tremendously rewarding career. Uh, not an easy one in many ways. I knew at 20 years old when I dedicated myself to working with this program that it would take sacrifices. But I thought the sacrifices of one person was uh, nothing in comparison to helping have uh, helping a species survive for all of mankind for future generations to come. Uh, again, a species that was almost lost due to human activities in one human generation. And so as I, I my SCA experience, I lived at the park and at night I would walk the beaches and I would pick up shells and I would learn those uh, names of the invertebrates. Again, so foreign from uh, this undergrad student from Cornell University. But I fell in love with South Texas and the friendly people, the lovely beach, the beautiful environment here, the magnificent resources. I did work that year with, with many different programs, ranging from ghost crab surveys to bird surveys to uh, vegetation work. And there were no uh, computers on your desk at that time. So we spent a lot of time in the field. And so I really got to enjoy the environment and learn so much. And in my position, there was an SCA and one seasonal. So I got to work with sea turtle legs of the most endangered species, help care for them. Can you imagine as an undergrad student, that tremendous responsibility, but opportunity. And they were still learning because this was a conservation emergency didn't know whether camps for these might be lost and some thought it might be too late. So our work was to form a secondary nesting colony here at the National Seashore as a safeguard against extinction. And so uh, when I first started here, we'd find one camps for the nest about every three to four years. And our largest number, we got up to 217 nests here in a year. So uh, a big increase and a su success that, that warms my heart. Uh, the, the turtles uh, from our program were experimentally imprinted and then taken to Galveston Fisheries, National Marine Fisheries Lab for rearing in captivity for nine to 11 months. It was called Head Starting. Started about the same time as was a project for the kids to give them a boost in life. So when they got out there, they'd have a better chance of making it but also they could be tech for future recognition. And uh, when I, I was tasked by my superintendent as the acting chief for the whole division, uh, after, it was a great opportunity also, but to uh, supervise, and he wanted me to start the first patrol program because they didn't know what age they matured. And it took a full 10 years of patrols, not finding any from the program and uh, having to train people and get them inspired because we needed to look. I felt like, well, if we cause these turtles to nest here, instead of their natal beach in Mexico, then we have an obligation to try to find them, document them for science, but also protect them while they're on the beach nesting here from various threats that could harm them or kill them or take their eggs. So we didn't have resources to our avails. So I, I had to work hard to, you know, beg Peter and Paul to take us down the beach to do the patrols. It wasn't the best patrol program, but we did what we could. Uh, once I found the first confirmed nest come, um, nesting turtle come back from the program, then I asked my major professor for my PhD, I, I need to find hire somebody that can help me find nests quickly. Uh, and he recommended uh, Cynthia Rubio for my staff and I hired her and she's been my right-hand assistant ever since. Got her in, in um, 1997, the year after that first returnee. 
And diversity has been an integral part of my program uh, ever since I was a supervisor. Women tend to gravitate to this work and our staff is primarily women. And, but we have men too and all kinds of backgrounds and we welcome them all. And the same thing with our volunteers. We get about a hundred volunteers per year. And I say, there's a place for everyone in our volunteer program. We could teach you what you need to learn about the turtles. Just come with a devotion in your heart to try to help save them and a love for the beach. And then we can put you in a place to help you out with our program. All right, I wanna say that when I first started in 1980, I had a ranger tell me, oh, those women in the park service taking the jobs away from the breadwinners of the family. It was a lot different time. Well, I've over time become a, a role model to women in a conservation program. I get women now who come to work for me saying, Donna, you're a role model for uh, a strong female leader running a conservation program, a big field program in South Texas. Uh, not an easy place to do that. And so the book I just showed you is Women in Field Biology, just published, talks about the history of females getting into the field of uh, field biology. And it would surprise you that it's relatively recent. And I'm one of the 75 women that was interviewed for that book. And our work's been highly publicized and talked about in a lot of books. So I do get women who come to work for me because they want to work for me as a role model, which I didn't have. I didn't have those mentors. I didn't have a female professor for my three degrees, except for that scientific writing class. So I wanna be there for them to give them what uh, I didn't have because it's important. It's important to help them and important to help everyone. I tried to, to help give them advice for moving on in their career. And uh, I know some will come back and work for the park service. Some will go on to uh, other occupations. I've had uh, one become a, a medical doctor that volunteered with our program. We've had many become professors, lead programs. And it's an aspect of my job I didn't anticipate back then because I was shy down from Syracuse. And now, working with all these people, getting to know all these people for through all the years has been one of the most gratifying parts of the work. Incredible people devoted to the work I've been doing. And um, seeing the numbers of turtles grow over time and then seeing recently that our husbandry work is, uh, we're working, looking at second generation kinship analysis, uh, turtle CSI matching, tissue of nests of unknown maternity to known nesters, building that database, that family tree, and now branching out for the second generation. We have seen turtles come back from those husbandry efforts. So yes, I feel like the, the, the proud mother, grandmother, and great grandmother to these other generations, but that's what it's all about. We have to have those future generations entering the stream to help repopulate the species just like we have to have these stream of helpers come in to our agencies uh, and academia to help raise young people that are science-based, fact-based decision makers with strong ethics and uh, diversity and inclusion. And they're really take it as an integral part of them and um, working together as a team, all these things that you've touched upon that I learned in the SCA and throughout my time here at the National Seashore. Um, but I want to again thank Liz Putman from the bottom of my heart because I would not have had this career without you, Liz. So thank you very much. And thank you so much for that, Donna. And thank you all for, for all of your responses uh, to, to my questions. And so with that, we'll move to the Q&A. Um, and again, I'd like to remind everyone uh, that you're welcome to submit questions into the into the questions box with your name, your affiliation, uh, and the question you'd uh, like to ask, as well as if you'd like it to be addressed to someone specifically on the panel. Uh, and plan panelists, go ahead and please keep your cameras on. And I now also invite our speakers, uh, Floyd and Patricia, to join on camera as well. 
And for uh, my first question, I will open the floor to all panelists. Uh, two part question. Um, what advice do you have for someone who's interested in working in conservation? And the second part is if you have specific advice for, S, uh, for interns, SEA interns, who would like to turn their internships into a career. And I'll, again, I'll open this up to anyone. So advice for anyone interested in working in conservation and specifically how to turn your SEA internship into a career. I could take a step at that one if that's all right, Kyle. Sure, go ahead, Floyd. Yeah, so th there's several ways. Um, and that's the goal, at least the goal for the youth program division is to segue from internship programs into full-time employment, whether it's with the National Park Service or any other land bureau agency. Um, there are hiring authorities that you can use that will escalate you to the top of the list if you use them correctly. There's also a way that you can do it through the internship program by learning a certain skill set that you are engaged in. Like if you're if you're interested in fire, or you can do your internship through fire. If it's cultural resources, gear your experience so it fattens up your resume, and do the I think it's 640 hours for you to to get the PLC. There's other hiring authorities that you guys can inbox me about, and my team, who I believe most of them is on the line, including Lucy. We can send you information about that. But those are the ways that you can get in and do the work that you love. Because they say, you know, if if you love what you do, it doesn't really feel like work. So um, that that's my advice, and I'm always available. Thank you, Floyd. Others? Yeah, I have a quick tidbit sure. to add. I'd say one thing that I found valuable was saying yes to or pursuing different opportunities that you don't necessarily would have, may not have seen yourself doing initially. Um, a lot of work with conservation is so interdisciplinary, where even if it doesn't line a job or another doesn't line up exactly with what um, you may see yourself doing later, where you start isn't never really where you end up, and you don't know what other opportunities can branch off from you saying yes to one thing or another. So I guess maybe avoiding pigeonholing yourself just because one position or another doesn't look exactly like what you maybe maybe would see yourself doing. Um, you, you never know what will come come up from that. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice, Jay, is to be open minded about your experiences. Other panelists want to answer the question, general advice for folks who want to get into the career of conservation. Uh, I can help chime in here, too. Sure. I, I agree. Uh, wholeheartedly about being flexible. Uh, to get my foot in the door with a permanent job, even with a master's degree, I had to take a dispatcher fee collector job. And uh, But what I did when I was here for my SCA is I said, I'm gonna work hard and uh, just let my work speak for itself and let other divisions see my hard work. And then maybe when an opportunity comes up, they'll hire me. So there was an opportunity that came up and uh, I was very grateful that the Ranger Division hired me for this position. Again, I had to put myself out there talking to people over the radio and <laughs> the whole park hearing my voice. Um, and then also going to a Vic in the day before the Iron Rangers where we wrapped on the door of the, the uh, RVs and of the tents to, to collect the fees and talking to people that way. So it, it helped those skills uh, to grow in myself and get to see other aspects of the park, which again, I was, I've been very, very, very fortunate. And I know my situation is, is pretty unique to stay in one place, uh, springboarded from this SCA position. But um, it, it, it uh, I found my niche right away. A lot of people don't, or you can't break in with a permanent job there at, the, at that exact time, but get from that experience what you can because you'll be able to apply it elsewhere. And the networking, 
getting to know people, getting to have the uh, know people as friends. The gentleman that was the uh, seasonal with me, I'm still friends with. He came and uh, volunteered with us for a couple of years recently. He taught me how to do photography and he came back and was taking beautiful photos for us. So uh, get to know these people. You never know where they can help you in your career as you're starting out. And go to school, get those degrees. Uh, there was a lot of competition for these jobs in our field. And differentiate yourself with experience and hard work because it's very slim chances that you're going to be hired for a, um, a seasonal or a permanent job with no experience. These SCA positions give you a chance to get experience in your field or something similar. And what a remarkable opportunity that is to be able to put that on your resume and become more marketable. So that's, that's my advice. And that's great advice, Donna. Any others on the panel like to contribute to the question? I think I'd just really quickly uh, echo what Dr. Shaver said. Um, I think networking is so um, important within our field. And um, I know at least within the SCA, we have um, you know, a very ready conduit for um, all of our current members and our alumni to hop right into Trisha, if you wouldn't mind posting that link. Um, we have the SCA network um, where alumni can um, network with each other. We have job postings like within the SCA and jobs that um, alumni post outside of the SCA. So it's a really good opportunity to meet alumni um, who are kind of in the same spot as you and uh, learn a bit about their stories. And also, I think um, Dr. Shaver also alluded to mentorship, um, getting linked up with a mentor who is um, able to kind of help guide you along your career and um, provide some um, help as you're trying to figure out your way and your journey is super helpful too. And um, things that I think I've been lucky to experience as part of my SCA internship as well. Thank you, Amy. Um, with that, I want to ask another question to the whole panel open. Uh, what are some ways that uh, Joseph asks, what are some ways that college students can get, uh, can help or get involved uh, with either or both the NPS and the Student Conservation Association? And a few of you have hit on this. And I know, Donna, you mentioned earlier that you originally saw your uh, posting on a fire hanging on the bulletin board. Um, but if anybody wants to speak more about how, how college students can get involved in, in this type of work. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Take up all the airtime, but I will say that we get SCA uh, members that are college students. I started that way. Um, Christopher started that way. A look on the, now it's not a cork board with a cork anymore. It's an online a board, message board with listing all the opportunities. Get on that site and look around and there's so much available. There's got to be something that really sparks your interest. And give it a try, apply. You never know, you might get in. This was the one I wanted and I got in. I was so lucky. And so apply. And then that can give you that experience. It's gonna make you more marketable for those seasonal jobs. And then from that, get more experience, get people to know you and then get into that permanent job. Mm -hmm. Or some of these new programs with SCA that can give you credits to help get into a permanent job without those other steps I had to go through. I, it was a hard path back in the old days ever to do the test for the register and, and um, navigate through other jobs. But um, look at those opportunities that SCA posts, you can get into those as uh, students. So Kyle, I know you're moderating, but I'm going to defer for you to answer a piece of that question. Sure. Um, 
Well, and I think we hit on it, and it's funny that you mentioned Donna that it's not not um, like that any longer. But I I would uh, also like to state that I did my SCA internship in 2015, and I actually also first heard about the SCA on a flyer on a bulletin board. Uh, so it is a very familiar experience, even in a what I'll say seven years ago, slightly more you know recent time. Uh, but to your to your point, uh, Floyd, and I, I forgive me who mentioned it, uh, it is often more more online boards now. And something specifically that I'd like to mention is is that the SCA, the way at least the current application process goes, is you fill out the application once with all of your interests and all the things that you are um, interested in doing, and then you can use that application um, for multiple different job postings and. That is such a um, great, uh, you know, having that ability um, allows you to, uh, you know, apply for the job that maybe you're like, am I really interested? Am I interested in that? Go for it. Go do, you know, use that application and take that risk um, and really um, put your put yourself out there um, and you never know. Um, but yes, I actually, like I said, uh, I actually also found uh, my SCA internship on a bulletin board. Pull, pull off one of the little pieces of paper. Um, would anybody else like to talk about how college students, anybody else want to answer the question how college students can get involved in either the MPS or SCA? Otherwise, I have one other piece to add to that as well. Open the floor back up. I just want to acknowledge also that Donna mentioned earlier that she had volunteers who help with her a sea turtle recovery program and that there is a very large within the National Park Service volunteer parks program. As I mentioned, I'm a volunteer coordinator with the Park Service myself. I think my SCA position really naturally uh, flowed into me becoming a volunteer coordinator. Um, and volunteerism with the Park Service and in general is also a great way uh, to get that experience that's been mentioned throughout uh, to this evening's um, event, which is getting that experience that you can put on your resume, whether it be with sea turtles uh, or uh, forest restoration or, or whatever it is that interests you. Um, so that's yet another way, even po possibly preceding uh, or after an internship that can also be added to your resume to help you get a, uh, a job in this career field. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open the floor uh, to another question for everybody. And if, uh, if you could talk about your most proud moment with your SCA experience, something that you are extremely proud of from your time during one of your, I know a few of you have had multiple SCA uh, internships or been on multiple crews, but your most proud moment from one of your SCA experiences. I'll jump in. Uh, again, I'm, I'm sucking up the way with the air. Um, I didn't come to SCA. However, when I when I did start, one of my um, first experiences with SCA was um, Hurricane Sandy. And the proud moment for me is to see how SCA gathered their staff, interns, volunteers, and jumped into a major superstorm that New York hadn't seen in a hundred years. And I was one of many leads for that, as far as agreements is concerned, coordination, um, incident command teams, and just to see how everybody, Army Corps engineers, uh, all of the parks in New York Harbor, people flew in from all over the country. And SCA was one of the major organizations and partners that came in to help with this uh, this disaster. And to me, and for me, to see so many young people come in and just try to help was amazing. So I just wanted to share that with the team and the group. Yes, thank you, Floyd. How about you, Angie? A proud, proud moment from, from your time at SCA? Um, I've actually had a few proud moments, um, and they weren't more moments like they were big, um, you need a huge celebration for. I think more so my proud moments were I've had breakthroughs 
um, as a person myself, um, where I would get recognized for um, being able to speak up more. Um, being recognized for involving other people in the crew, speaking up more. Um, I also just like from my most recent experience, I believe my most proud moment was when um, in Idaho, where I was located, um, there was a wildfire that had just started and I, among many of my crew members, witnessed it start um known as the moose fire and we sa was located in my sa crew was actually located in um indianola ranger station and we were told that we would need to evacuate since the fire was literally over at the ridge uh, just at the ridge um across the river from where we were we were and my most proud moment in that time was ensuring that everyone had all their necessity items and ensuring that everybody was here in the moment, um, sane, um, and ensuring that they were hydrated also as well. Um, it was hot <laughs> and the fire was coming in. You can feel the heat already. And um, my crew leader at the time, who was just the only crew leader, um, unfortunately there, um, she was on the phone with our supervisor and she was running back and forth from the phone and that within itself is already exhausting and already having all that pressure on her shoulders is already exhausting as is. So um, I luckily already had my stuff packed. We were supposed to go for hitch. So, um, but I just started running around doing, being the messenger um, and ensuring that everybody was hydrated, had the items needed to evacuate. Um, and ensuring that everyone was, was sane um, in the moment, aware of what was the next steps to do. Um, but I think the overall, my most proudest moment while being an SCA was being recognized for my work. Um, usually that takes, this is a lot more about the management, but being recognized and getting the credit that you are, the credit that you deserve for the work that you have done is, what I would consider is my most proudest moment. Like Dr. Shaver, she's been recognized for all the work that she has done with working with turtles and being for, um, again, she was recognized for her uh, uh, leading JS award, I believe. Um, and those are just recognizable moments that you should be proud of because you worked hard for it. And I believe as Kyle, you mentioned, as long as you've worked hard and let your work I believe someone mentioned it. As long as you your work, hard work shows for it, that should be something that you should be proud of and it should be recognized. Yeah, thank you, Angie. Others like to share a proud moment from their SCA experience. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. So you can see I'm not shy down from Syracuse anymore. Um, I, I would say two things. Uh, I was proud because I, my work did speak for itself. And one of the employees here said, Donna, stop working too hard. You're making the rest of us look bad. So that was, <laughs> it was recognized, but uh, it didn't feel like work. I was enthralled by it. Uh, and this was before a lot of the automation. And in fact, we had to uh, read the temperatures with doll head thermometers that were placed into each of the boxes. And we would need to go back every two hours and read those temperatures. And it, it spanned you know, from like six in the morning all the way to about eight at night. And I didn't mind. Uh, the, the chief said, oh, you don't have to go back. We'll find somebody else. No, nope, no, nope, I'll do it. And it was a pleasure because I lived right here. It was no big deal at all. And uh, I, and, and we were very proud because it, the, the chief worked in, in town about 30, uh, 15 minutes away, 50 miles away. And he didn't come out here all that often. So the hands-on care of the eggs were with the seasonal and myself. And again, this was a conservation emergency and the procedures were to be being developed as the project went on. So we were able to make a mark 
on how those eggs were cared for and developed procedures. Right then, again, can you imagine an undergraduate student helping shape how the world's most endangered sea turtle eggs are cared for? Like uh, there was a cheesecloth put on top of the eggs to help look for hatching. Well, that cheesecloth was a medium for mold. So we said, well, that's not good. So we got rid of the cheesecloth because it would kill a few eggs. Uh, you know, the, the mold spores would, would go down and, and into the eggs. Got rid of the cheesecloth and put this plastic coated screening and no more mold pro problem. And it saved some of the eggs. You know, we had turtles that hatched because of that. And then releasing the hatchlings. What a magnificent moment seeing these turtles take their first steps in life. And I never grow tired of it. And I say, well, it'd be my time to go when I do. And I never have, and I've never grown tired of seeing the nesting turtles. Um, and they're, they're doing this, this ritualized uh, emergence from the water, coming out, digging a hole, covering the eggs and tamping back and forth vigorously. You can feel it up through your legs. And a visitor reported it as, oh, I saw the turtle dancing. Well, <laughs> I knew that it, <laughs> I knew that it had nested. Yeah. I gotcha. And um, so it's just uh, making a difference from early on to help structure. And I think that helped instill in me that there was still more I could do to help move this project forward. And I did I developed a program with conservation, research, and education as the three pillars, all integrated and feeding into each other, either uh, each other, and all critical to the work. So, thank you, Donna. And we're closing out on the end of today's event. Um, and I now want like each speaker to give one last ten to twenty seconds uh, tidbit of uh, a final message for our audience. And so we'll go in reverse order. Uh, Donna, we'll start again with you. Again, just real quick, we'll go Donna, Jay, Angie, Chris, Amy, Floyd, and lastly, Patricia. So Donna, again, real quick, just a final message for our audience today. Final message is be bold, take a chance, take one of those positions, get the experience. It may change your life in ways you can't even imagine, as my experience did me. And again, thank you, Liz for uh, giving me not only a job, but a life filled with wonderful, wonderful memories. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Jay? Yeah. I mean, I experienced such tremendous growth um, through SCA, and that was because it allowed me to go beyond what I thought I could do. And so my closing remark is to embrace discomfort be okay with the unknown um, and allow yourself to be surprised by yourself. Thanks, Jay. Angie? Yeah, I'm kind of picking back off of Jay, just be open-minded and grow, but also um, be patient with not only just your fellow coworkers or crew members, but also with yourself because you are still growing as a person and you are coming to face with things that you've never probably can and confronted before. So just be patient with yourself. Thanks, Angie. Chris? Keep it simple and to echo Jay, take it one day at a time. Thanks, Chris. Amy? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Park Service. Thank you, Floyd and George, Liz and Trisha. Um, such a great experience I know I've had and many other alumni have had. So thank you and happy 65. Thanks, Amy. Floyd? Oh, Floyd, you're on mute. Sorry, I thought I pressed that button. Three small things. Um, perseverance. They reward hard workers with more hard work. And best of all, we work in places where most people vacation at. So keep that in mind. Thank you guys and thank the team. Thank you, Floyd. Patricia? 
Yeah, I'm so honored to have the, the final word. Uh, thank you so much to Floyd and Lucy, um, to Cecilia on my team for all the work that went into this, to all the panelists, to all of you amazing alumni, to all the staff that's here. Like, so, so proud of SCA and all we've accomplished with in partnership with the NPS. Um, cheers to 65 years. I love that title of this event because it's so true. You know, so cheers to all of us. Liz, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you so much. I hope you got that message from this, from all the speakers and uh, well done everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. And yes, thank you so much, Liz, from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of all the panelists, thank you uh, for, for founding SCA. And again, thank you all for this, uh, for joining us here today. If you'd like to send comments or questions about today's event, uh, you can contact the MPS Youth Programs uh, or the SCA via the contact information that's in the chat. The event recording will be linked on the official event page in the coming days, uh, which again is also in the chat. Again, thanks for joining today and cheers to 65 years. Thanks everybody.